Um, so I want to welcome you all to our final panel. Thank you. Well, we have one more round table after this, but I want to thank you for sticking through us with this day of um, very invigorating, very interesting talks, everyone both in the room and everyone who's tuning in online. Uh, I'm very excited for this panel because it features two faces that are very familiar to me from my previous time at the University of Pennsylvania. So without uh, any delay, I will introduce this panel, which is on data tools. And this panel is uh, moderated by Stuart Varner, who I owe some personal thanks to because he was responsible for my paycheck for a while, previously at Ben. So, <laughs> Stuart Varner is the managing director of the Price Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. In 2003, while a student at Emory's Institute for the Liberal Arts, he started working as a graduate student assistant on the Emory Women Writers Resource Project. Though it wasn't called this at the time, this was Stuart's introduction to the digital humanities. After earning his PhD in American Studies and a Master's of Library and Information Science, he began work as the Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Emory's Woodruff Library. He managed the Digital Scholarship Commons until early 2014, when he accepted the position of Digital Scholarship Librarian at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Stuart arrived at Penn in September 2016, Stuart is passionate about helping humanities scholars take advantage of digital tools and techniques, but also about empowering them to be critical users and consumers of technology. He is also excited about the potential of digital tools to make humanities scholarships more dynamic and accessible for people outside academia. He's been a member of the IMLS and Mellon Foundation supported Collections as Data project, and he will introduce the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. Let me put on my glasses so I can do all this. All right, uh, a little footnote to that. Uh, I did uh, work as the digital, uh, or sort of work in the Digital Scholarship Commons at Emory with Marianne Posner, and uh, it, was, it was so nice to uh, be able to work with her and learn from her uh, all those years ago, and it's, uh, it was amazing to see you last night, so thank you very much. Um, so, I'm super honored to uh, introduce the final panel, uh, but first I want to thank everyone at APS for, for hosting such a fantastic program. Um, as well as all the presenters who gave us so much to think about and to Todd for helping us out with all the technology and making that work so seamlessly. Um, I suspect this might be the first in-person conference for many of you. It's actually the first one for me too, so what a nice way to sort of ease back into you know, what this is, is like. Um, Let's see, I want to introduce the panel now, and this is an extremely accomplished panel, so I'm gonna have to read uh, all of this. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, first, uh, L.P. Coladangelo uh, is a doctoral student in the College of Communication and Information at Kent State University in Kent, Ohio, and the project manager for the Digital Scriptorium 2.0 a project to redevelop a national union catalog of pre-modern manuscripts in U.S. collections as linked data. He holds an MLIS from Kent State, uh, Kent State University's uh, School of Information and a BA from Sarah Lawrence in Bronxville, New York. His current research interests include knowledge organization of cultural heritage metadata information, uh, I'm sorry, information representation uh, of folk traditions, digital humanities, and uh, semantic technologies. Lynn Ransom, uh, who works across the quad from me, um, uh, is the curator of programs uh, at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies at Penn Libraries and oversees the Schoenberg da database of manuscripts an open access research tool for provenance research related to pre-modern manuscripts. Uh, Lynn currently serves as uh, president and executive director of Digital Scriptorium, a national consortium of American libraries and uh, museums committed to free online uh, and aggregated access uh, to their collections of pre-modern manuscripts, and is the co-editor co of the uh, Schoenberg Institute's uh, Manuscript Studies, a uh, journal, uh, Manuscript Studies. Um, Lastly, uh, but of course not leastly, uh, uh, Holly Brewer is uh, the Burke Professor of American History and Associate Professor of, uh, at the University of Maryland. She's a specialist in early American history uh, and the early British Empire as well as early modern database, uh, I'm sorry, <laughs> early modern debates. 
uh, <laughs> about justice. Um, she is currently finishing. <laughs> She is currently finishing a book that examines the origins of American slavery and larger political and, and ideological debates. It is tentatively entitled uh, Underhand Empire, Slavery and Sovereignty in Early America and the British Empire, for which she was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 2014, uh, as well as uh, fellowship support from the NEH uh, and the Cromwell Foundation. She is also pr principal investigator for, uh, for a a documentary editing process supported by NHPR. You're gonna have to remind me what that is. Yeah, NHPR. Historic Publications and Records Commission. That's the one. Basically, US, US National Archives. Got it, okay. Um, let's see, uh, called, uh, and that's called uh, Slavery, Law, and Power, uh, which seeks to provide access to important but often obscure documents uh, that help to put the emergence of slavery in, the Ameri in early America into an imperial context. It should also be mentioned uh, that for the past two years, she has co-chaired an open access committee at the University of Maryland, and that's going to be a huge part of what you're gonna talk about. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to the panelists. And LP, are you going first? Yeah. Great. Uh, thank you, Stuart, and thank you. I, I wanna reiterate my thanks. To, I'm gonna take this off so I can speak and breathe. Um, my thanks to the organizers, Adriana, Nathan, everybody who's involved. This has been a really good conference. Uh, I'm always daunted to be in the last session because there's a level of expectation that the papers that have come before uh, mine uh, 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 that, that exist now that I feel like I need, hope, or at least I hope I can meet. Um, so for my part of the presentation, um, I'm just gonna open, make it to the, yeah. Hmm? Sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanna say a few words to contextualize the project that my colleague LP uh, will be speaking about in more detail. The project, as Stuart says, involves a da database that I manage at the Penn Library. It's called the Schoenberg Database of Manuscripts. And it contains a growing number of over 257,000 entries that document the existence and physical characteristics and textual characteristics of pre-modern manuscripts that are made through observations recorded in various sources like auction and sale catalogs, institutional catalogs, inventories, and also uh, researchers who come to use the, the Schoenberg database can also contribute, <coughs> excuse me, can contribute. Um, most re researchers who use the database are interested in tracking the provenance of pre-modern manuscripts. In addition to the manuscript data, we've also been developing a name authority that users can contribute to as well. The STBM name authority now contains over 40,000 records identifying people and institutions from around the world who are involved in the trade and the production of these manuscripts. So I include this slide just to give you a, a visual of what the Schoenberg database looks like when you come to it online. And this slide shows the latest names that are entered in the name authority. And these are constantly being added to almost on a daily basis uh, by anyone out there sort of in the, in the uh, internet universe. So you can see, um, I think you can see that some names that there are names that include links to things like the Virtual International Authority file, um, which if you're not familiar with it, this is the library, this is uh, uh, an aggregator of name authorities from national library uh, catalogs from around the world, and this includes like the Library of Congress. So VIAF number indicates that the SDBM name that's linked to it is a known person uh, documented in other sources. In many cases, and you see some of these here, actually most of these are without VIAF numbers, the SDBM name authority record, records are the only digital documentation for these historic persons or institutions. And so without these records, the SDBM records, the identities of these people and the, and the institutions would otherwise remain hidden in an online research environment. And it's in these gaps that we see the real potential for contributing new knowledge, not just about the production and trade of pre-modern manuscripts, but about patterns relating to the creation and transfer of knowledge across time. As, uh, many, missing especially 
are the identities of a large number of women, for example, that are involved in the trade, and we know this because they appear in the sources, but we can't find them in, in any other context. As well as a large number of figures representing non-European manuscript traditions, including Jewish, Islamic, Asian traditions that have suffered from a lack of scholarly attention over time. So from our perspective, then, the name authority has developed into a really unique and a rich resource that could be used to reconstruct these vast networks of people and institutions that underlie knowledge creation and transfer from pre-modern times to the present. The Schoenberg database is an open database, but it sort of caters to a very niche audience. And so we've been thinking about over time, like how do we make this resource available to more people? How do we drive people to it? And that's how Wikidata came to our attention. And that is what LP is gonna talk about, how we contributed a certain subset of these names to Wikidata. So I'll hand it over to you. So our, our project was predicated on um, the notion of kind of funneling from the opportunities and challenges presented by big data, which is all of that sort of large, fastly, fast accumulating, uh, messy, heterogeneous data. Um, and, and really taking that big data, um, enriching it against existing data or with existing data to make it smarter. Um, and our approach was to use semantic enrichment um, to enrich our open link data set with another open link data set, namely that of Wikidata. And now, without giving a huge kind of like primer about RDF and, um, and how the mechanics of it work technically, um, what I will say is um, by leveraging uh, semantic approaches and, a linked, and linked data structures to match entities, what we hoped to do was um, to enhance the value of the data we already had. As Lynn mentioned, in some cases, you know, these names only appear in our database, um, or there's very scant information in terms of what we have. And so um, that, that notion of using um, semantic enrichment and using linked open data as a, smart, as a way of smartening our data uh, really sat at the heart of our work. Um, and, Value is one of those things that can be both, um, it's obviously contextual and subjective. So what we were looking at specifically was what would manuscript scholars be most interested in in terms of imbuing more value in the name authority data we had. Um, and often they're looking at um, LAM data, and in our case it's sort of LAM adjacent data, um, archive, uh, a library archive museum data, um, which is really rich and authoritative. You know, there's this is backed up by, um, you know, by uh, observations that folks are making, they're documenting, um, and so scholars want to be able to access this data in some cases because it's rich, but we're hoping to make it richer. Um, our methods were really a combination of open and open source tools and technologies used in linked data projects. Uh, we use Sparkle queries, uh, which is the, Spark which is the uh, query language used to query RDF graphs, and that allowed us to isolate our data set and to validate our work. Uh, OpenRefine was the software we used to reconcile our data set against Wikidata, um, and we used VIAF data to assist with that process. Our work also in, uh, involved us becoming familiar with how Wikidata kind of views the universe, as well as their socio-technical infrastructure, um, and that included, you know, getting familiar with their item property value triples. Um, it also included understanding how they have descriptive statements and links to external IDs. And really, those allowed us to leverage and align our data to Wikidata. And finally, our process involved reconciling to and uh, editing um, exist our existing open data set in order to donate our data. This gives you a little idea of our um, project workflow in which we manage not just uh, technical work, but also interfacing with members of the Wikidata community and our own scholars. It was often a push-pull process um, where we integrated the nature of our data set with what manuscript scholars uh, wished to know and what was possible given the, the opportunities and limitations of both our data set and uh, what was present in Wikidata. We were able to donate, and that means match and link, um, 9,600 names out of, a, out of a test case of 12,000 names. 
Um, with this linkage, we were able to answer nine of 10 questions that were posed by manuscript scholars, and the details uh, are in the paper for the specific, I don't wanna get into the details, but um, you'll be able to actually uh, review the queries themselves in the paper. Uh, we also worked with manuscript scholars to introduce them to our work um, through workshops so that they could understand how Wikidata and OpenRefine could be integrated into their work. Um, and that included developing metadata ap application profiles for Wikidata um, so that they would know how to align data from their work uh, into Wikidata. So this is an example of uh, one way that we aligned what we had in SDBM with sort of the properties and values that are present in Wikidata. So think of these as almost like a one-to-one -one relationship. And in a lot of cases, you know, Wikidata was representing data differently, and so this, these metadata application profiles would allow scholars to kind of match like to like and help them to add their data to Wikidata, which might not be sort of eligible for, for inclusion in SDBM. So things we wanted to, to kind of talk about with you um, are the, the notion that although name authorities can be controlled locally, what we think is interesting um, work for the future is how, we, how to manage authorities in which they, we relate and communicate authorities with one another. How do we link them up? In other words, um, part of that local control, LAM institutions can decide to what extent they want to enrich or connect uh, their data sets. And um, we want to you know, work with them in terms of, especially manuscript scholars, in terms of managing how um, they participate in these conversations. Researchers can decide what venues or um, LOD repositories are best for, their, for publishing and linking their data. In addition, um, you know, what, what we want to do is we want to help manuscript scholars move to this LOD environment to take you know, their CSV files and punch them up, essentially, to smarten their own data by contributing it to, play, to, um, to places like Wikidata. And part of that was you know, helping them to participate in this ongoing conversation that's happening already in, in terms of Wikidata communities. And ultimately, you know, we wanted to get, as Lynn said, we wanted to get our data set out there to expose it, to smarten it, uh, to allow others to access, access it in another place and to make it part of, an, of another um, larger ecosystem. So thank you for your attention. I just want to give a quick shout out. Um, this project happened because LP was a leading fellow at Drexel University's leading program, and we've been, Penn Libraries has been lucky enough to be part of that, and it's a fantastic program. Hello, and welcome everybody to the last paper of the day. I'm delighted to tell you. Thank you. <laughs> I know, it's actually been a really exciting conference, and I have to admit, as a historian, and I look, when I looked at some of these titles, I thought, mm, I'm not gonna really be that interested in some of these papers, and I was wrong. I was completely wrong. I loved so many of the papers here, and one of the, um, things I'm pushing for in this paper is a more collaboration that's interdisciplinary and I feel um, um, I want I feel even more faith in that larger aim after hearing this paper <clears throat> so um, I'll just I'll just read the beginning at least um, we now live in a rapidly changing knowledge ecosystem wherein students rarely consult printed books and articles Okay, oh, much better. Um, and where, wherein many of us, even historians, have gotten used to the ease of finding our sources, both primary and secondary, via web search engine. Um, my own university has deprioritized the teaching and research of history in favor of hiring professors for our new iSchool, or information school, as though artificial intelligence tools can provide access to and sort all knowledge, even historical. And obviously, I approve of that on some level except that if it's a one for one and it's, um, we're not hiring in the history department, it's, it's sort of um, bizarre. And so I feel like we need a better conversation about that. But um, at the same time, scholars in all fields have been handing over much of the curation of that knowledge and access to that knowledge to private companies. These companies range from now primarily digital publishers, such as um, 
um, Elsevier and Wiley, and I actually, I put this up here, here, I'll go back to that in a minute. Um, here's Elsevier. Um, to, to those of primary so historical sources such as ProQuest and Adam Matthews, which provide not only images, but the tools we use to sort and access the information. And Elsevier, just to, um, most of you know this story, but just in case you don't, Elsevier got um, monopoly control over many of the main scientific publications um, in, in the United States and Europe. Um, jacked up the prices, has been making his for-profit company, um, delivering more than 40% profit now every year. And um, at our university, where I co-chair the PAC committee um, that was mentioned in the introduction, it consumes, along with about four others, almost all of our library's accession budget, meaning we cannot buy books, databases, et cetera, and that amount has been constantly increasing. Um, and here's Wiley is another one of those. Oxford and Cambridge have been actually now, though they're nonprofits, following some of the same model. When I had an article that appeared in the American Historical Review in 2017, if you did not have access through your library, they were charging $48 a pop for people to be able to read it. Um, anyway, uh, and here are the two, two of the leading um, kinds of leading producers of databases, ProQuest and Adam Matthew. Um, what is most astonishing is that scholarship that scholars produce with little remuneration aside from our own pay as professors, often in my case paid by a state university, is being transferred to such private entities and then sold back to the universities and to other institutions. It is with that background that I confront the crucial and yet thorny and complex problem of how to approach the exciting developments in using artificial intelligence to read and decipher to make sense of early modern manuscripts. I argue here that such manuscripts are crucial to how we do history for this era. In a world where printing was privileged and censored, manuscripts gave us insight into, a pri into private thoughts, into backroom deal making and everything in between. We cannot rely upon the more widely available and now searchable and accessible printed canon to understand the early modern period. We have to make manuscript knowledge more central to our interpretations, and we are at a point in the development of handwriting text recognition AI technology when doing so is possible. However, it is tough. Early modern handwriting and spelling is highly diffuse. Only with what computer scientists call human in the loop models that can detect and refine the reading of particular handwriting can we develop particular models for particular errors and styles of handwriting. And here I'm not going to, I'll show you these in a little more detail later, but you can see on the left here um, one of the pages from Barbados Slave Code from 1661, which is actually really hard to obtain now. It's in, only in manuscript people who are specialists share their photographs and each try to transcribe it again and again, but by bit it's very hard to read. And the question is, um, um, and the problem, part of the problem is even by decade within early modern secretary hand, of the, which is just one of many kinds and styles of handwriting in early modern England, um, the, the, the handwriting can, train, can change significantly. And the H, for example, will become unrecognizable. Um, and so you need really finely attuned models to be able to read this material. You need a lot of specialist training to be able to read it. And, um, but we're now at a point where we, we can, we can fine tune models with this human and what <clears throat> human in the loop, meaning human beings constantly interacting and training particular models, which a lot of early modern historians now have been doing. Um, and so this is one of the projects where they've been doing this, the 1641 deposition project um, based, um, based at Trinity College Dublin. And um, they've, they've taken 8,000 depositions, which luckily are only in the handwriting of about four different people, and they're all in a single year. And they use those to, with human beings reading some pages very carefully, creating what's called the ground truth model, and then using AI algorithms, which they train and retrain to get more, act, act, um, more accurate computer reading of these manuscript sources, and they were able to get about 95% accuracy. And it takes work, and it takes framing and putting the, um, the depositions in in a particular form, but with humans being involved in this training, 
um, you can get much more precise, accurate transcriptions. And it's made a little bit more complex as well, because in this period right after, you know, not too long after the invention of the printing press, as more and more people became literate, there were not only many different styles of handwriting, but there were many different kinds of spelling. So all of, but all of that can be adjusted by having humans in the loop. And um, so what I want to argue here is that the human in the loop model works not just for transcription as a model for the involvement of um, humanists, um, humanist historian, humanist interlocutors in the AI project uh, in terms of this sort of technical issue, but more generally, that our contextual knowledge, our deep understanding of particular periods, of ways of the background for things is actually crucial for the entire AI project. And I want to add something here um, before getting into specifics about how important it is we realize that we are in the midst of an AI revolution that is primarily defined most historical knowledge as static, and in fact, I would say even almost humanistic knowledge, that is as something to be memorized or found. Big tech generally does not see history as a science. They see it as not requiring skilled knowledge or interpretation, not requiring subtle investigation or framing. Algorithms designed by AI folks are being used to sort and access our information, to share our wisdom and our scholarly input that we have very little role in framing and that often de-emphasize such learning. And I'm talking here um, about you know, the basic Google search engines, for example, or even Google Scholar to some extent. And more importantly, the 21st century education push by big tech has stated repeatedly that teaching history in K through 12 or even in college is not important. You can Google it. One response we've seen um, in the field of history education is Sam Weinberg who developed a forceful response in his Why Learn History when it is already on your phone, one that emphasizes the interpretive and contextual skills provided by, by historians. Um, and while he's in history education, I think we all, and this primarily, some, a lot of the battles over this were fought like in the 2000s um, on the level only of K through 12. I think they're now deeply impacting um, higher education as well. I was involved in one such contest in North Carolina in 2009, 2010 where they wanted to cut out all teaching of history K through 12, except for um, world history after 1945 and US history after 1877. And exact, that's exactly what I kept hearing. They don't need to learn history. They can just Google it. The, the, you can, when you think about the consequences of they're just going to Google the Holocaust, they might be as likely to get Holocaust denial histories. I mean, this is like an obvious way of obvious problem. So in the pages that follow, I analyze why AI is so important to our scholarship, but also why we are so important to AI. And let me resort to an experience I had directly out of college in 1986. I was an uh, undergraduate it, um, in history of science, and I ended up getting a job right after college working for Rockwell Science Center, which was a basic research lab where I had interned before I started college. And they had tried several times to hire um, publicity companies to write a brochure, but and the scientists were always unhappy. And so I ended up spending months doing interviews with all these different scientists there um, and then creating a 57-page brochure. And what, but one of the things that I remember about that most intimately was the director of the AI lab there who, was, who had this card. Clearly, he'd shared it all over the place, probably to you know, um, major research grant, DARPA, and everybody. Uh, which was of a bicycle, which, which was a line drawing and was missing some of the lines. And we human beings could all see what it was, but he couldn't get the computer to recognize what it was. And so that was the problem then in 1986. And I still think it's the problem for AI. Obviously, they've been able to teach the computer to learn to recognize that bicycle, but they're still working. You know what we're doing? when we're participating in a training HTR programs, which I'll talk about more in just a minute, is we are, um, we are in fact, um, pro we're providing the human in the loop model that helps the AI to recognize the bicycle. Um, and we're doing it over and over again. Um, and so it's in recognizing, um, so, it is in recognizing the latter and really thinking about it that it is so essential that we consider exactly the terms in which we are using AI. When historians and archivists 
teach AI programs to recognize early modern handwriting, we are providing crucial information. We need to try to make sure that we, what we do with AI in terms of developing not only the databases, but also the tools to collect and analyze information is open access and doesn't belong to private companies that can sell and monetize that information and then make it expensive or impossible for universities or archives to access. Hardly needs to be noted that they then try to sell it back to us, can make it even impossible for us to use or to afford it, um, even when we have helped to create those databases. So the rest of the paper does two things. First, discusses the state of play of HTR technology for the early modern period. Second, it lays out how and why it is so important, following Sam Weinberg's arguments and others, that we historians take advantage of AI technology in ways that own it to create multi-dimensional models for sharing and accessing historical interpretations, which is what I've been trying to do with the digital edition and database that got me into this AI work, um, which is Slavery, Law, and Power, this project for, this project for which I'm a, a um, um, project director. Um, most of the materials we seek to make available are manuscript materials, which are difficult to decipher, particularly before 1660, giving, given the wide variety of different spellings and different handwritings. So um, the main program to be able to, right now, that's been, been the, the go-to program that's coming out of Europe, um, and which even in the last two or three years has really transformed in its ability to decipher text, is called Transcribus, and all the next three, pro we, so the 1641 deposition project used Transcribus, it's the, um, is the user interface, and I'll talk a little bit more about the HTR programs are using in a minute. Um, Georgian Papers program, just this part of it where they were trying to read particularly um, um, uh, tables was using it. Um, sorry, I thought I had one more, maybe I put it in. Um, I, I did, I, you know what, I put it in the wrong order somehow, just a minute, I'm sure it's here. Here, at this one, the Amsterdam City Archives is also using Transcribus. And all three of these are also using what's called HTR Plus technology, um, um, HTR Plus um, program for handwriting text recognition, and which is the primary program um, available on Transcribus and the most developed. So, um, once you've developed a model on this program, you, um, you, you keep refining it to, to fit in more and more detail the actual things that you're reading and what language you're reading them in, and it helps you, you um, decode them. And the more you do it, the more precise your, your tools are. But um, the problem is that with HTR in particular, you might temporarily own the model, HTR Plus, which is the main mod thing that they're using on Transcribus. You might temporarily own your own model, but you can only run it through their license. The HTR program, Plus program in particular is a black box to computer developers. They, we can't tell what's in it, and it's owned by a private company, which when I wrote to Transcribus expressing my concerns, they informed me that it's owned by this commercial company called Planet, and you can see here, sorry, this is the first thing. And one of the partners of Planet, as is clear from its webpage, is Adam Matthew. You can see down here, this is the webpage for Planet. AM obviously has access to using HTR Plus as it becomes increasingly sophisticated due to scholars' input into Transcribus. They are in turn using the models of HTR Plus developed by scholars on Transcribus to develop an improved base program for reading all handwriting, which they sell as part of their database products. Um, so, this one, for example, their, their um, database um, on colonial America is um, images from the National Archives UK, which they have scanned in for free, in which for which they provide handwritten text recognition, at least for searching. They aren't doing full transcriptions in this. They're doing what's called a quick sort of search ab ability using a minimal version of HCR. Um, and as... Um, as Dr. Patrick Sparrow of the um, American Philosophical Society uh, writes, um, is quoted on their webpage saying, handwritten text recognition is going to transform scholarship and the types of questions researchers can ask. The technology has tremendous potential. Of course I agree. And on some level, I appreciate Adam Matthews' company's efforts, 
efforts, I have helped our researchers and researchers at other such private companies think about how to assemble scholarly databases and what they might include in them. But, and it's a big but, how much do they charge? What happens when they get bought out? Who controls all of this information and the, and the tools to analyze it? Can only some scholars at some R1 universities access this knowledge? Which brings me to a second option that Transcribus makes available for handwritten text recognition, and it's called Pilea. This is just the second page of, of the um, Adam Matthews. Um, sorry, I, for some reason my, um, my files got mixed up, so, but here's, this is the one I want to, you to see. Um, it's called Pilea, and it's been less used, there are less, fewer models developed with it, but you can see how when you're, 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 you sign up for Transcribus and you want to pay, um, you have a choice between Pilea or HTR Plus when you're um, choosing what kind of data, um, tool, HTR tool, to decode your data. And Pilea um, is, um, is open access. So I'm going to have to go back because I mixed up the order here. So these are... Um, this is HTR Plus, and this is Colin Greenstreet, who's, um, who has a project called Marine Lives Project, which is transcribing the Admiralty Court records from the UK National Archives, which are huge, um, have everything to do with early America. Um, they're all shipping, all shipping cases and files and monitoring, et cetera. But you can see here with HTR um, Plus, in um, 2018 and 2022 how much it's improved. When he tried it in 2018, he gave up and went back to hand transcription because you can see how terrible it is on the left. Almost none of the words are actually readable. By March of 2022, you can see that it's, it's um, pretty accurate. There's a few mistakes in here, but more and more this word, you know, ship, for example, gets transcribed correctly here in 2022 using the new model that's been trained, whereas in 2018 it wasn't doing it at all. Um, and I don't know how my files got mixed up this way, but anyway. Um, but um, this is the other option, which is called Pilea. And you can see here, he um, again, this is from Colin Greenstreet. He has marked out how many words he had to correct in Pilea, but on the whole, it's not quite as accurate as HDR Plus because not as many people have been working with it. But you can see here that um, there weren't a lot of words you had to replace. Even that is pretty accurate. So, um, and Pilea, unlike unlike HDR Plus, is not a black box. It's not owned by Adam Matthew. It's not owned by Planet. You can find the um, the code to make it work and to refine it here on GitHub, and it's completely open access. Um, so, and it turns out that on some level, Transcribus itself is amazing, and and it's a co-op. But actually, when you look closely at it, it's a co-op in terms of sharing expenses and getting access to things, and you buy credits in the co-op, but you don't actually get to govern it. And it turns out the user interface provided by Transcribus is also a black box. In other words, it's also proprietary and they don't give access to other people to share. Um, so um, at the moment, um, I'm cautiously op optimistic about Transcribus, which is based at the University of Innsbruck in Austria and only has a few US members. I joined up as part of a team at the uh, I, uh, my, my group at the University of Maryland and we're trying to be part of their conversations and to make sure that, um, you know, and to try to push towards open access models, not only using um, Pylea more, um, but also to, um, also to um, thinking, you know, more intentionally about whether the transcribist user interface should be more open access. Um, but I also want to add one thing that's definitely not in the paper because I was talking to others about this afterwards and I, um, some of my colleagues even use another program. Who, they don't work mostly in Western manuscripts and this has not been used nearly as much by people w working with early modern English paleography. It's called eScriptorium and it's being more used by scholars in um, working on medieval Persian history or um, as, as is the case here with my colleagues, sorry. Here, Chaim Lapin, who who works uh, in Jewish history, 
he's using he's able to use it here to um, transcribe a 12th century um, Judeo-Arabic manuscript, and you can you can see here the blue imprint is what you do when you when you try to you have to hand set up a, every page, and you can see how he's doing that, and then he's able to to get a transcription. Now he had to again train a model very particularly but it's very successful. But one big difference between Escriptorium um, and Transcribus is not, no parts of Escriptorium are black box. Both the Escriptorium model itself is open access, available on GitHub, and so is its um, HTR text recognition software, um, which is called Kraken, I love that name. Um, both of those are open access and can be developed. Right now, as I said, and I'm gonna repeat this because it's important, most of the high energy work being done in early modern tr um, paleography, transcription, English language, and actually almost all European languages of, of Latin writ handwriting is being done with Transcribus. And right now, most of that effort is going into changing, into training a proprietary model um, and creating a kind of monopoly on that model and use of it um, that is, um, is going, the more effort that goes into that model, the more it's gonna be so far superior to other models that that's all we're gonna be able to use. And when, and it turns out when I then wrote to Transcribus and I said, here are my concerns, and they said, oh gosh, um, actually turns out HTR Plus is about to be retired by Planet and they're gonna create a new model with a new name and they're gonna charge more. They haven't let us know how much more. And it turns out that my, my concerns are exactly correct. Um, so um, getting back to then my project, I'm not gonna go into my project in detail, but I wanna just point out a couple things about it. It's, it's actually harder, because the project I'm working on with a team of graduate students um, is, is actually looking at documents from many different eras. It's harder to train a ground truth model than it was with the 1641 depositions project or for, for Colin Greenstreet who's looking at one year of one person's handwriting for admiralty court records. But it's still possible um, and we're experimenting with it. But, um, but, it's, um, but it's hard, I mean, you know, we'll, we'll do our best. But most of all, I've, what I've come out of this wanting to do is to support efforts so this is a um, LOC 1698 plan for reforming Virginia's constitution, for example. Um, is to support, um, but you, so you can just see here that some of the, um, no, I don't want that one. Um, you support efforts to, but you can see here how diff different the handwriting is. You can see here, this is the 1661 Barbados Slave Code again. How, how different the handwriting is and over time we can't, I, I'm not going to, my little team isn't going to be the leader on, on all of this effort. For, but what it's made me realize is how crucial it is to be aware of these problems and to intentionally collaborate, to write grant proposals that will help you create access to open access software so that when we're all training our own particular data sets, we are co collaborating into um, a software model that all of us can then again use for free or close to free, um, setting aside only costs necessary um, to help create and support the, both the user interface and the tool itself. And um, so I'm not, again, gonna go much more into my database except to say that um, one of the things that became so painfully clear to me, and I, and I just wanna to recur to this because I know I paused at the beginning when I mentioned this, but is censorship. This was a period when there was so much censorship where if you criticized any royal policy, and for example, slavery, which I've been working on, was royal policy, it opened you up to charges of sedition and heavy duty punishment. And you had to be very careful, as Morgan Godwin said when he called slavery a pact with the devil when the king was the head of the slave trade in print. He said, I know I'm taking my life in my hands in publishing this. And we don't know how it, he died shortly afterwards and it's not exactly clear how, but the official censor, Roger Lestrange, was throwing people in jail without trial um, routinely in this period and I've seen those records. So my point is, manuscripts are super important, too long neglected. We're at a point now when we can access them much more easily using AI technology, but we need to own it as humanists 
And I don't mean, I mean copyright issues, but I also mean we need to, to consciously take advantage of where we fit into this loop. That we are not only crucial for the transcription, but crucial for the inter interpretation, for the framing, for the curating of deciding what goes into the databases and what gets left out. And so we should be, as we're entering the 21st century, where AI has, and computers have taken over so much, we need to consciously imagine where we belong within that nexus. And humans in the loop as a concept um, applies in both ways to that transcription, but also to the contextualization. We are providing the lines that help us see the bicycles and also what's behind the bicycles and what's going on in the larger picture. Um, and last, if you're interested in potentially collaborating on future grants, if you want to be part of this, please reach out and let me know. And we'll try to create, I would like to see the creation of some sort of consortium, which I would like to be part of. Thanks. We have about 10 minutes for questions. I thought I'd just maybe get things started. Uh, this is a very small question, I guess. Um, so talking about open access, talking about linked open data, I've been in digital scholarship centers for a long time, and these things come up a lot. They're kind of incredibly labor intensive. There's a lot that goes on uh, to make these things work, to make these things available, to make these things um, fair, and I'm wondering, what does this mean for libraries and archives and museums as organizations? Who does this work? Uh, is this, and I'm kind of thinking about, you know, there are digital scholarship centers. Is it okay to just sort of put all of that into one, into one area, or is this sort of an organization-wide shift? So like I said, very small question. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Um, I think I can start, and, and, and my answer is not going to represent the way libraries work. It's going to represent the way that my particular institute for manuscript studies and the digital age works. And what we tend to do with our projects, especially the Schoenberg database, is kind of put it on the researchers to, who are using our tools to do the work. So in the Schoenberg database, all our data is available. Um, we're, it's a crowdsourcing project, but we're not asking people to do it out of altruistic purposes, but to make it part of their research cycle. So as they're getting data, getting information from our database, they also have the opportunity to contribute back. And that's also what we're doing with Wikidata, is putting it out there in the world so that other people can tell us more about our data, because we don't know a lot about these names, and we aren't gonna know a lot more about these names because it's not for example, in my particular subject specialty, but it might be someone else's out there. So I don't know if that's an answer to your question because it's not really what libraries are doing, but I think it's, it's an approach that seems to be working for us is to somehow integrate the relationship of the user and the data a little bit more um, to make it more proactive. I. I think that one of the main purposes of American universities is not only to teach people how to become citizens, but obviously to train them for future opportunities and careers. Um, and that the knowledge that's in these records is crucial human knowledge to help us understand the past and that there are ways that these this effort can be made much more central to what universities are trying to do. They could be part of courses that are taught, whether in iSchools or history departments or others, where, where students themselves take ownership of and help to transcribe some of these materials and introduce them and make sense of them, much as some teachers are now trying to get students to create, say, Wikipedia pages, they could do more of this work. Um, I think that funding these efforts already is um, and has for a long time been part of what the federal government is supporting in grants like the NHPRC 
from the National Archives, from NEH grants, from occasionally even things like NSF grants. Um, and it could be um, a lot of the times in the past, those, those support have gone to things like the Jefferson Papers, who's hidden behind the um, ben Benjamin Franklin Papers, the figures that are hidden on the wall behind the screen. Um, but more and more, the NHPRC has told me they want to support um, collaborative editions like the one um, that I'm, I'm behind or thematic ones. So what I'm trying to say is a lot of resources of the federal government are now used to support basic um, research in the sciences or even the applied sciences. And I think we need to make an argument for why more of those resources should come towards expanding human knowledge in some of the ways humans do, humanists do in interaction with um, AI technology and that these skills will be useful beyond just the actual knowledge that's been created. They'll help train students to be part of the current um, you know, with with skills that are crucial for for business and other venues, other um, other kinds of jobs to, in the future. So, I th I think the thing that's encouraging for me, and it's not a silver bullet solution, but it's um, kind of to echo what Lynn was saying in the sense that um, it's a distributed effort, and everyone works in their corner or their sphere, and they do a little bit of work. But if you're using open source tools, and you're using and you're making your data open, um, and linking it to other data like we are, um, folks don't have to do that work again. Or they can reuse your work, and they can remix your work. Um, you know, it's kind of the irony of like when you um, when you catalog. Uh, any material, you're hoping you catalog it well enough that you only have to catalog it once, you only have to touch it once. And that just doesn't <laughs> happen. Like that's, you know, people are, you're always revisiting data. But the point is, is that you have a lot of um, context and understanding about how to reuse that data um, and making it available to folks so that, again, it's, you know, it would be great if we had institutional support and we had, you know, large scale projects. But I guess what I'm encouraged about is sort of a, a democratization and a distribute, you know, a, a, a model of distribution um, that allows communities to and individuals to take this stuff into their own hands. Right. And I just want add one to add one word, which is crowdsourcing. Crowdsourcing is huge in terms of some of the transcription, but I think could also be used to expand HDR stuff a bit and then fix it. Do we have any questions in the audience, Miriam? Let me bring the mic over to you. Thank you. I, I really enjoyed all of those papers. Uh, so continuing in a way the question that was just asked, um, uh, well, I, I, think, I think it would be fair to say that like the aspirations that accompanied the initial um, enthusiasm for linked open data like have, have yet to be realized. And um, I've, I've wondered about why that is and wondered if, if part of the reason is the difficulty conveying to someone who, who doesn't have experience with linked open data, like what an ontology is and like the kinds of connections you can make among entities. Um, and, and I've wondered about like the possibility of an interface that helps to guide a user through the data model as, as they query. I wonder if you've thought about something similar or if you've kind of thought about interfaces for exploring um, linked open data. I'll just say really, um, really briefly that um, one of the, that was sort of one of the challenges we had with manuscript scholars is that, you know, they'll have their, um, their data as a CSV file, right? Or an Excel spreadsheet or a Google spreadsheet and um, they want to make it linked open data. And um, I think that seems insurmountable to them. And linked open data like promises a lot of things in terms of like connecting the entire universe of data and, and you know, um, which we can't realize yet because you know, there's a lot of uh, interoperability issues and uh, conceptual issues and, and just the, the, the sheer labor of it. But um, what I tried to do was to encourage them is, you know, if you know about the five star linked open data model, like you already have, when you have it in a CSV file and it's authoritative, you kind of have two star data. Like you're already at a good start. And so I would just use that as in, in terms of like encouraging folks to say, you have a CSV file, let's put it into um, you know, a tool like OpenRefine or Quick Statements or with a little bit of you know, finessing, 
um, we can now add it to a linked open data repository. Um, and so at least, you know, from my end, that's, um, that's kind of the proselytizing or, that I do uh, to encourage folks. Like, you have good structured data, you know where it came from, um, let's punch it up a little bit and, and I'll help you do that. At least that, you know, that was the thrust of this particular um, project. So I've, I've actually had that, that same idea because I, I, I'm a humanist. I don't, you know, I manage databases and I work with people who know how to make and build the databases. But in the work that we've been doing with the Schoenberg database, um, and then this other project that we did called Mapping Manuscript Migrations, where we aggregated three different data sets in a linked open data environment, I really came to value um, understanding the data model and the modeling process as part of understanding how the data works. And so I did actually ask, um, we, had, we were working with um, UI designers and asked if they could make an interface that looked like the data model, model, you know, the actual diagram. Because when you start in, in a linked data, data model, RDF, you, what, what you're doing is you're building sentences, you're making these connections, a subject, a predicate, and an object, and this is how we think. And once you kind of get past that sort of initial, I don't understand this data model, you, you begin to understand that it's actually how you really think. And it's much closer to that than I would say like a spreadsheet or a relational table. So I, Yes, exactly. I mean, I, I, I proposed that and I just got crickets from the team, <laughs> but I think it's a great idea. I think someone should work on that. I'll just add really briefly that um, to bring it full circle, um, and Lynn and I have had conversations about this, you know, kind of rebridging that gap between ontology from a philosophical sense and ontology from an LIS sense. Um, we're talking about formal conceptualizations that are shared, right? For, you know, the rules of how the universe works, whether it's, how, you know, for machine readable data or how we um, conceptualize the universe. And really, data modeling is a humanistic endeavor. Like, it tells us sort of a path to follow about how one piece of knowledge is connected to another piece of knowledge. And so um, when we're working with scholars and walking them through, like, you know, and they're saying, like, well, why does Wikidata model it this way? Well. You know, those, those, that's the way that these folks chose to do it, but, you know, SDBM is structured in a different way, and then there's so many, you know, domain considerations, but ultimately, it's like walking folks through philosophical questions, and sort of the more that we can use illustrative models and say, this isn't so far from, you know, the notion of how philosophers make statements about the, the universe and connect ideas to other ideas, um, that's kind of what we're doing as, as information professionals. I think this might be a, a stopping point to get some coffee. Got a question over here. Quick. Oh, then it's not a stopping point. Sorry to ruin the fun. Um, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, fascinating talks. Thank you. Um, so so what, what was interesting to me is that one of the first talk was about plugging into an existing sustainable system that is that is that has worked in an evolving way for the last 20 plus years. The second talk was about saying, let's start such a system, <laughs> right? And then getting from that second talk point, let's start one, to getting to the point of Wikipedia and then Wikidata, it's, it's an incremental effort, right? There are a lot of steps in between. And there are models in the academic world for successful evolution from that first point to the second point. And I think engaging with those uh, groups that have, that have demonstrated success in these endeavors, I think would be a great next step. Uh, making an appeal to those of us in this room is probably a good start to maybe to get you to, uh, to the people who, are, who have been doing it. But, but there, there is a huge community of the, out there of ap academic tool developers. Um, and and we, we can take that offline. But th thank you for a great presentation. Thanks, and anything you can do to put me in touch with the kinds of developers who might be interested in collaborating on this, I would really appreciate. I, I, um, 
just to be clear, like Colin Greenstreet, who I mentioned, he had sort of given up on transcribus, and then I, I framed all these issues in this way, and he got completely, he got interested in it again, and he's he's been working on it amazingly the last few months, and really focusing on what Pilea could offer because of the issues. So I mean, I think that there's a, it shows there's a lot of possibilities for just redirecting the course of this river a bit. It's not completely starting from scratch, but being conscious about what we're doing as it's happening. And I want to second Holly's optimism. I think that's great. I mean, in the face of what looks like sort of too big to fail corporate information providers, it is actually quite good to, at this conference, recognize the possibilities that we can, that we still, the power we still have, that we haven't necessarily seeded everything. So thank you all to our fantastic panelists for great presentations.